Hi, everyone. Welcome to You Are Ready to Form a Business, Everything You Need to Know with Amy Manzelli at NOFA New Hampshire's 20th Annual Winter Conference. And I'm Nikki Kolb, NOFA New Hampshire's Operations Manager. I'll be hosting this session with Laura Andrews, NOFA New Hampshire's Program Coordinator. First, please note that we are recording this session and all sessions throughout the conference, and we'll share the recordings with you at the end of the week. Everyone will be muted during the workshop, so please type your questions into the chat throughout the discussion and we'll answer your questions along the way. Nova New Hampshire aims to foster an inclusive, safe, open, and welcoming environment for all, and we encourage participants to keep questions and comments constructive. For technical issues, please feel free to communicate publicly through the chat or message Laura privately. And if you would like to access closed captioning, click on the CC icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen, click the arrow on the CC icon, and then click show subtitle. And if you're watching on a smaller screen, click the three buttons at the bottom of your Zoom screen that read more, and then click show subtitle option. And if you have questions, you can chat to us about how to use that. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that this conference is taking place on the land of the Penacook tribe or Ndakina, the Abenaki word for the traditional ancestral homeland of the Abenaki and Wabanaki peoples past and present. We acknowledge and honor with gratitude the land and waterways and the Alnobak or people who have stewarded this land through the generations. Thank you. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Amy Manzelli, attorney and part owner of BCM Environmental and Land Law PLLC. Thank you and welcome, Amy. All right. Thanks, Nikki. I'm really excited to be here. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen now and get going with my presentation. All right, so everybody just want to make sure you can share, you can see my first screen, right? Okay. So as Nikki said, my name is Amy Manzelli. I'm one of the attorneys at BCM Environmental and Land Law. You see our beautiful little front stoop. Uh, it's a hopeful image there with all that lush green. Um, I work alongside with Jason Reimers, uh, Tom Hanna, and a bunch of other wonderful professionals. We do all sorts of um, environmental and land use law that's all uh, listed down there. But today we're going to talk about why form a business. Uh, the biggest reason to form a business is to protect your assets. Now, a lot of folks, especially when you're in the position of just starting a business, you know, and they've said it to me, I don't have any assets. And if you think about it, you actually do. I mean, you might have a wedding ring, you might have a car, uh, really everybody has something. You don't have to have millions in the bank to have assets. And actually the less you have, probably the more important it is to make sure you don't have them exposed to liability. So it's very, very important legally that um, you protect those assets from exposure when you're forming uh, your farm or your food business. There's other benefits too. It helps keep you organized. Um, and it helps keep your personal bucket of stuff, your appointments, your money, uh, separate from the professional stuff. So there are benefits aside from the liability, but the liability is the biggest one. And I apologize, I am gonna harp on that a little bit as we go through our time together today. And I should have noted too, as we go through our time together today, Nikki is going to interrupt me with questions because I wanna make sure that our time is tailored to the questions that you most want answered. So please do just chat away. I see a couple chats already landing. Um, Nikki and Laura are keeping track of those and will let me know as we go along what those questions are. But really, I wanna answer your questions, so lay them on me. Okay. So there are a few different types of business structures. Uh, I'm gonna go over some of those different kinds. 
LLCs are the most common, but you've probably heard of some of these other types, corporation, partnership, nonprofit. There's really no uh, one size fits all, although LLC is the one that I am most often recommending to folks. An LLC is a limited liability company. So if it works correctly, it limits liability. It doesn't always. And that's important to remember. It's simple, it's easy, it provides some of that asset protection we talked about. Um, typically, there aren't any cons when we're talking about pros and cons if you're a small business. Just so you have some examples, though, of what some of the cons might be, if you're a business that is big enough to pay for health insurance for your employees, so that's a, a bigger business. So, number one, you have employees that assumes a certain size of the business. Number two, you are paying for their health insurance. That assumes an even bigger size of a business. So if you ever get to that size of a business um, and you, form, you um, formed an LLC, then the payment for those health insurance premiums, those would be treated as taxable income under an LLC structure. And if you were a corporation or something else, it would be treated more beneficially. So there are some cons to an LLC, but typically those don't kick in until you start operating like a much bigger business. And most of the clients that I work with in the small farm and small food business uh, don't hit a lot of those thresholds. Just to mention them though, you know, a corporation, a legal entity, again, that's separate from the personal entity, Great for nonprofits. All nonprofits are actually corporations. They are nonprofit corporations. Uh, NOFA New Hampshire is a nonprofit corporation, for example. Um, one of the aspects of a nonprofit corporation is that it requires a managing board of at least five members. Um, and one of the cons of a corporation is just more complicated overall. So when you're talking about your taxes, management, administration, it's complicated across the board. And there are advantages to those when you're a very big company, but it is um, harder to administer the company. Partnership. One really important point of a partnership is called, the legal terms are joint and several liability. So, I'll use Laura and Nikki as an example. Let's say they want to make, uh, let's say, a creme brulee company. They're going to make creme brulee together because they just love it so much. Um, however, Laura messes up one day. She, you know, I don't know, doesn't pasteurize something. And, you know, there's a contamination and people get sick and they sue the company. But it was 100% Laura's doing. Nikki had been warning Laura not to do the thing that she did that made everybody sick. Nikki knew Laura had been messing it up. Laura did it anyway. So lawsuits come in, lots of liability. Nikki knew what was going on, tried to prevent it. Well, Nikki is just as much on the hook as Laura is because of that joint and several liability. All the partners are liable for all the other partners' doings. That's what joint and several liability means. So um, it's, you're really in it together when you're in a partnership. Um, and that's different than when you're in an LLC or when you're in a corporation. Um, it's really the business that's on the hook when you're in those types of businesses. When you're in a partnership, it's really the human beings that are um, jointly and severally liable for the other human beings. It's a, a distinction for partnerships. And I also wanted to highlight this pro or is it a con? You can form a partnership without any papers. Um, these other things, we'll talk about how to form these business organizations, but a partnership, you can actually just form by saying you're a partner. So let's say, again, using Nikki and Laura here as examples, let's say they did no paperwork whatsoever, and they just you know, got together for drinks one night and said, hey, let's start that creme brulee company. And, uh, and then the next day they said, uh, okay, let's make some creme brulee. And they went to a farmer's market and they said, hey, we're partners. 
we want to sell our creme brulee here. And they did, and people got sick that would be considered a partnership because they told people they were partners. If you hold yourself out as partners, then you'll be considered partners under the law. And that's different than an LLC or a corporation. You know, Nikki couldn't walk into the market and say, hi, I'm, you know, I'm a limited liability company with my friend, Laura. Could we sell creme brulee? That's, you cannot form a limited liability company that way, or a corporation, or a nonprofit, but partnerships are different in that way. All right. So a nonprofit, I wanted to focus on that a little bit. A lot of um, my clients have this sort of uh, like a social benefit, a community do-gooder type attitude, which is terrific, and I am so aligned with, and I love to work with those types of clients. Um, but they also think that a nonprofit is a is actually a type of company. So I wanted to list this here to explain that it's actually not a type of company in and of its own. So this pro here is the key takeaway, may be approved as tax exempt. So the way nonprofits work is First, you have to form as a corporation, a, and actually in New Hampshire, it's called a nonprofit corporation. If you stop there and you bring in income, then that income is subject to income taxation. But if you fill out the proper forms with the IRS to become most commonly a 501c3, but there are other types of income exemption, then you become exempt from federal income taxation. And most people, when they say, oh, are you a nonprofit? Or are you a 501c3? That's what they mean. They mean, are you exempt from federal income taxation? And most organizations want that exemption. You want to be exempt from federal income taxation. But there's lots of hoops you have to jump through, and there's lots of strings that are attached to that. You have to comply with a lot of restrictions. You have to have a board of directors. There's only certain types of work you can do. There's restrictions on uh, governmental relationships. So not every uh, business enterprise is going to fit within a 501c3 model federal income exempt nonprofit status. So I just wanted to mention a lot of clients come in and say, you know, I want to be a nonprofit. And some of them become nonprofits, but many of them become LLCs instead. Okay. So we've gone through, let me just go back one more slide. Um, Nikki, are there any questions about the types of organizations and businesses? And I'm going to pause here for a second. If anybody has any questions, pop them in the chat real quick, because we're going to go on. Um, I had a question. There aren't any sure. questions in the chat, but um, would you be able to explain briefly like a difference between, for example, like a sole proprietorship and a partnership and an LLC and how those might compare? Yes. Um, a sole proprietorship is the official name given to um, when an individual is operating on his or her own without formally organizing a business. So if Nikki just woke up Saturday morning and said, uh, I'm starting Nikki's creme brulee today, Nikki would be a sole proprietor. So most, or I shouldn't say most, many small farm and food businesses who have done nothing paperwork wise, they just grow their diversified veggies, um, you know, free range their poultry, harvest their eggs, whatever it is that they produce and they sell those things, they are by default a sole proprietor. When you are a sole proprietor, there is zero liability shield between all of your assets 
and your professional enterprise. They are one and the same. So it is the riskiest setup for your business. Got it. Thank you. That's really helpful and hopefully to folks on this call. And we do have another question here from Will uh, who asks, can nonprofits pay the owner a salary, reinvest into the business, et cetera, or is that considered using profit? Great question. The answer is yes. Nonprofits can pay employees and nonprofits can pay owners of land. But when you form a nonprofit, there is no longer, quote unquote, an owner of the business. So I'll use NOFA as an example. There is no owner of NOFA. Nikki doesn't own NOFA. Joan O'Connor, who is on the board of NOFA, does not own NOFA. If anything, the public owns NOFA because it is a publicly supported charity. So let's say you had a farm, for example, and you wanted to convert it into a nonprofit. There's a couple of ways that you could do that. Um, but in the end, the farm would no longer be owned by the farmer. It would be owned by the nonprofit organization, managed and controlled, governed by the board of directors. And that board of directors could pay a salary to the farmer as the employee of the nonprofit. An alternate structure would be that the nonprofit could, uh, the farmer could still own the farm and the nonprofit could lease the farm from the farmer and there could be a tenant landlord relationship established. So there's lots of possibilities to involve a nonprofit, but it's clear, it, I want to make clear that um, you can't have both the owner and the nonprofit. The nonprofit um, becomes the owner in most circumstances. All right, we can do more questions and follow up as we're going along, but I want to talk about operating agreements because they're so exciting. So what is an operating agreement? Um, it's not a long, boring document, which is what a lot of people think it is. Um, no, it's not. It is really, it should be the operating manual, the lifeblood of the organization. So you have some money come in and you have a couple different owners and you need to know how they get paid. Your operating agreement should say that. You have a dispute and you need to know how to figure it out. You have an impasse. You need to know how to figure it out. Your operating agreement should tell you what to do. Someone died. I mean, this stuff happens all the time. And you need to know what happens to that person's debt or ownership share or voting rights. The operating agreement should tell you the answers. A good operating agreement is written at a time of peace and harmony amongst the owners so that when things go awry or when things become euphorically wonderful, which is another thing that happens from time to time, you know what to do. Because in a quiet moment, you've written it all out. They're tailored to your business needs. Um, and if you don't have one, it's very important for you to know what happens. In New Hampshire, as in all the states, there are um, various acts on the books. So there's an LLC Act, a Corporations Act, a Partnership Act. What I mean by this is there's a whole pages and pages of laws that say what will, how your company will operate your company if you don't have an operating agreement. So I put in an example here to show you what I'm talking about. So if you cracked open the law books in New Hampshire and you looked up RSA 304-C colon 50, 
about how to fire LLC managers. And let's just imagine you were the manager of your LLC and you had three people, three other owners. Um, an operating agreement, it says, an operating agreement may provide for how to fire a manager. Unless the operating agreement provides otherwise, the manager can be fired by majority vote at any time for any reason or no reason. So you could write into your operating agreement that you need a unanimous vote for this to happen or a super majority. And you could write in that you need a reason, you know, like good cause or something like that. But if you don't tailor, if you don't have an operating agreement and you don't tailor it to how you want it written, then all these default provisions that exist in the state RSAs will apply to how your business is run. And that's gonna stink for you. I'm just telling you right now, because there's all this stuff in there that you have no idea what it says. You've never written it. You've never considered whether it's a good fit for you. And I'm telling you right now, some of it will be a good fit but some of it won't be a good fit. So it's important to understand that these will apply to your business if you do not have an operating agreement. And it's best when they're created by an attorney. So um, here's, here's an exercise for you, right? Um, look at this box here. In this, I'm using myself now. I'm not going to throw Nikki and Laura under the bus anymore. So this is just imagine, use your imagination here. Imagine that I had a lease for the law firm where I work. And on page one, it said BCM environmental and land law is the tenant. And then on the signature page, you know, page nine or six or 11 at the end of the lease, it was signed by me and I'm a lawyer who is one of the owners at BCM Environmental and Land Law. So who is the tenant? Is it me, Amy Manzelli, as an individual? Or is it my business, BCM? So the reason I ask this is because I actually had this case for a farming family because they entered into a lease that was not written by a lawyer and they did not use a lawyer when they signed the lease. And someone had typed the name of their business, their farm business on the first page. And then one of the farmers signed their individual human being name at the end of the lease. And then things went sour and the landlord tried to evict them from the land and they hired me to fight the eviction. And we had to fight this all the way up to the New Hampshire Supreme Court. And we won. We won that the farm, not the human being, the farm was the tenant. And I'll spare you all the details about why it mattered. The point is who to thunk, right? Who to thunk? that this stupid little difference of writing the company name on the first page and the human being of the company name without the company name on the signature page would have mattered. No one who has not gone to law school would have thought that mattered, right? And that's why I'm just gonna go back and say it, best when created by an attorney because there's all this little stuff that is so easy to miss because when you look at stuff like this and you know there's harvests to be had seeds to be planted cows to be rotated it's just not something that you're likely to focus on so let the professionals do it. It's an investment that is well worth making. It's worth noting that paying an attorney to prepare an operating agreement is gonna run you, depending on how needy of a client you are, 
it's going to run you between $500 and $2,500. And that variability really depends on, you know, how demanding you are, how many questions you are, how responsive you are, and how, um, you know, complicated your situation is. Lawsuits, you know, anywhere between $50,000 and $150,000 and a year or two. So when you weigh those two things, um, the choice is obvious. And when you think about, when you have that reaction, like, yeah, but I'm not going to get into a lawsuit. It's not going to happen to me. Just think for a second about people you know and what you know and how many people you do know that have had disputes that either they had to close their business because they couldn't resolve them or they did have to hire a lawyer and they had to have a fight. Those are two outcomes that you want to avoid. Okay. All right, so before we move on to insurance, which is the next big thing you need to start your business, are there any questions about operating agreements? Nothing in the chat right now. Okay. All right. You guys are a quiet bunch. So it's going to keep getting more interesting. Insurance. All right. So we're just going to run through the different types. Uh, the most important thing about this is to just have a good insurance agent. The umbrella might be the most important of these couple slides. You want to be under the umbrella. You want to make sure you're covered. So general liability, that's going to protect your business from claims of bodily injury, property damage, or personal injury. So if you get sued, your general liability insurance should cover you. Property insurance is what's going to protect your buildings, your fencing, your milking parlor, your infrastructure. Business income insurance, that's going to protect your incoming revenue in case your business income is interrupted, in case of, you know, it could be a ransomware attack, it could be an illness, it could be a couple different things, it could be a global pandemic, you know, four years ago, nobody would have expected something like this, and there have been a lot of business interruption claims recently. Um, professional liability, not so common in farm and food, uh, but sometimes you'll get um, a, a multi-rider policy that will have a little bit of coverage. Workers' compensation insurance gives your employees coverage. This is not optional. If you have employees, um, you're required to have it. Cyber liability is optional, but it's you know, one of those things you do not want to skimp on because it is becoming so common to have uh, interruption due to malware in your computer system. And it is becoming so common that farm and food businesses rely increasingly so on digital means. You know, I do in a lot of local food shopping and I do a, a lot of my payments. I get invoices over email. I get invoices through texting, you know, and if you get crippled in your electronic means of receiving payment, that's not good. And then directors and officers insurance applies if you're a small farm and food enterprise that is a nonprofit. So your board members, if they are ever sued in their individual capacity, uh, will be protected. And if you uh, do not have this type of insurance, then you will have trouble attracting board members to serve on your board because most folks are gonna be looking for this type of coverage. Um, Amy, I'm what, Amy go ahead. we do have a, a question. Go for it. All right, Ellen asks, how different is operating agreement and insurance for nonprofits versus businesses? Great question. Um, 
So let me, I, th I think there's a couple different questions in there. Um, the words for operating agreements as between a for-profit and a nonprofit are very different. So in the nonprofit world, most of us are familiar with the term bylaws. And so nonprofits have bylaws. Um, For-profit companies will have either articles of organization or an operating agreement, depending on whether you're a corporation or an LLC, a couple other terms too. In terms of content, they're quite similar. Um, they, they will cover, you know, how to make decisions. How do you, what kind of majorities do you need? Um, what the quorum is, how many, how much of the ownership do you need to have present to have a meeting? Where they differ, they differ based on the nature of the organization. You know, the nature of a nonprofit is to, to a certain extent, money will come in. You know, there is the raising of funds, but there's no divvying up the pie to go into anybody's pocket. There's the reinvesting of the money towards the nonprofit's mission. So the bylaws will speak to how to do that. For-profit documents, people are concerned with money. So there'll be a lot of words about how to cut up the pie and who gets what piece of the pie. And also, how to bring new ownership in and how to let current ownership out. So, so there is some difference between the governance documents when it's a for-profit organization versus a nonprofit organization. Um, for the insurance question, there is not that much difference based on the type of organizational structure. The difference in insurance is based more on the activities and assets of an organization. So let me explain that a little bit. If you're a nonprofit organization, like I'll use NOFA as an example. Um, NOFA does not own real estate. So we don't own a farm that we op that NOFA New Hampshire operates. So right there, NOFA's risk category goes way down low as compared to let's say a for-profit farm that owns real estate. Because I'm assuming the farm has, you know, a farm worker, maybe the farm has agritourism events where members of the public are coming, farms tend to have hazards at them. So you can see the different risk profiles. Also, farms have assets. You know, I don't need to remind folks how expensive tractors are, for example. Trucks, um, inventory stock of seed. Um, if you're a conventional farmer, there might be um, chemical storage. Um, milking parlors, the livestock itself, the spring chicks, all those um, tangible assets. So when you're looking at a small nonprofit like NOFA, you know, when you list out the tangible assets, there are some computer workstations, there are some laptops, most of the assets are its human resources. So it's really the activities and the assets that drive the insurance. Um, now you could have a nonprofit, many nonprofits have very high risk categories. For example, schools, some schools are nonprofits. Concord Hospital in Concord, New Hampshire is a nonprofit. That's a very high risk category. Um, so it's really, it's what are the assets and what are the activities that drives the type of insurance and the coverage of the insurance. I wanted to make one quick mention for insurance coverage, especially in the context of a business startup where you might just have a minimal amount of coverage where you're getting going. If and when you begin to have events, especially like your first event, or a first annual event, 
please make sure you call your insurance company and let them know you will need a, a rider, a one-time coverage for each event. If, you, if your insurance company is not aware that you are doing events, they just know that you're you know, a diversified um, vegetable farm and they don't know the public is coming to your farm for that one day pick your own event or the one day solar fest and something were to happen, you may not have coverage for that day's event. So please, when you're having events, make sure your insurance company is aware. Any other questions, Nikki? Okay. No, that's it. Thank you. All right. So moving on, a couple other uh, smaller things in terms of they're easy to do, but they're not small in terms of the importance to your company. So business name. Uh, when you're starting out, you got to pick a business name um, and you can't just pick any name. Uh, first of all, branding is important and that's, you know, way beyond the legal scope. It's not really a legal thing to pick a good brand name, um, but there is a legal limit that you cannot pick a name that is too similar to an existing name. And it's a tiny bit enigmatic. Um, what the New Hampshire Secretary of State's office will categorize as too similar. Um, but if you go to the Secretary of State website, you can check to make sure that your desired name is available and acceptable to the Secretary of State, um, you know, before you go get the t-shirts made and change your license plate and do all those permanent things and get really too excited about your business name. Um, and you have to have that name cleared with the Secretary of State as a first step before, you know, you go forward and fill out the LLC paperwork or the corporation paperwork or move forward with any of those steps. If you were going to um, take, as I said, the riskiest route possible and do nothing and just be a sole proprietor, which would be a bad idea, um, then you should go to the Secretary of State and register your name, um, you know, Manzelli Farms, for example, as a doing business as name. At least that way, um, you know, my sister can't go ahead and form Manzelli Farms LLC and steal my name from me. Um, so at, at a minimum, you can register a doing business as name, a DBA, if you're going to um, choose the risky, risky road of sole proprietorship. We have a question, Amy. Um, Megan asks, at what scale do you recommend forming a state recognized business, such as small homestead wanting to sell excess produce or canned goods versus small farm producing exclusively for public sale, question mark, and should the homestead file, is there an income level that should trigger filing? Mm -hmm. uh, that was several questions. Yep. Um, that's a great question. You know, if it's anything beyond recreational. So homesteading has a, um, has a variable definition, you know, um, and excess can, can mean a, a lot of different things as well. Um, you know, if you're giving me a dozen eggs a week, because your hens are just very prolific and your family can only eat so many eggs. Um, I have no problem with that. The triggers that I would point to are um, anything value added. And by that, I mean, you are taking a raw ingredient and converting it to something else, which it seems like you might be doing there. Did you say it was preserves, Nikki? Canned goods, produce or canned okay. goods. Hand goods. So that is a value added product. Um, and the reason I say that is because that introduces an increased level of risk of contamination or sickness from the consumer. Um, so that's one pointing towards incorporation. 
two is if there's any commerciality. So gifting versus sale. If you are gifting, that's more along the lines of recreational. If you are selling, then that is more along the lines of it would be beneficial to incorporate. Um, it's a it's a fine line, you know, really, it's how much risk are you willing to take? And to whom are these goods going? Do you know the people? What is your relationship with them? Uh, but really, it comes down to the risk that you're willing to take. Did that cover everything in the question, Nikki? I think so. Okay. Yes, Megan says thanks. You're welcome. Okay. Um, no commingling of the business funds. Commingling is one of my favorite English words, by the way. Uh, so you need to get a business bank account. And um, I'm going to reorder my slides in the future because a later slide we're going to talk about you need to get um, a, a tax identification number, also known as an employee identification number, a TIN or an EIN. It's essentially like the social security number for a business. It's the identification number that the IRS uses to keep track of business organizations. So you will need that and your identification and your business name, and you'll go down to your branch bank of your choosing, or I'm probably dating myself, maybe you young people will log on to your bank account or banking institution of choice, and um, you will open up a bank account in the name of your business. The reason for that is you want to keep your business money and your personal money separate. And the reason for that is to keep the liability shield that your business provides for you. So I want to walk through a concrete example here. Uh, let's say that you know, you're a small farmer, um, you go to the farmer's market, you sell your produce, you, you, know, you come out with 200 bucks cash that day. You want to go to the grocery store and buy family groceries with that $200 cash. You really shouldn't. You really should go through the difficult you know, discipline of you deposit the $200 cash into your business operating account. And then from your business operating account, you can do a disbursement to yourself of that money. Because you're the owner of your business, you can certainly take money from your business for personal use, but it has to flow through your business first. If you don't flow your professional money in and out of your business, then your personal assets could be at stake in case any of the bad things happen, in case there's a lawsuit, in case there's you know, one of your employees claims wrongful termination, anything like that. And, and it kind of you know, makes all that liability shield that you were going for all for naught. So it's important that you get all of the stuff you need, you know, that you get a debit card, a credit card, checks, an account. Um, and if you want to be really setting yourself up for success in the future, a savings account, you know, where you build yourself that rainy day cushion for your business for if and when you need it. Um, and again, it does help to keep you organized. So it's important to not commingle. Was there a question, Nikki? Yes, and um, I don't know how many slides you have left, so I just wanted to flag that it's 1245. And we have yep. a question about this slide, and then we had a comment from Joan that I just wanted to share from the naming slide. So Will asks, what if you have an off-farm job and want to infuse money from that job into the farm business? Yep, so um, it's kind of actually like, um, a lot of other banking things, money can come in from almost anywhere for any account. It's the coming out that's an issue. So you can definitely take your off farm job money and put it into your farm account. It's 
it's you don't want to take your farm money and put it into your personal account without it hitting your farm account first. That's the no-no. Um, and, and that's, you know, taking your off farm job and putting it into your farm account, that's just startup investment. That's fine. There's no problem with that. Great. Um, and then we have an, a couple other questions too. So going back to the naming, Joan had a comment that uh, she says, I was told the state has relaxed some of the business name restrictions. I had Concord Winter Farmers Market registered and the state approved downtown Concord Farmers Market. So she, she said she didn't challenge it, but advised to maybe watch out for your trade name. I don't know if you have any like comments about that, but um, helpful personal experience. Yep. Um, I'm not going to cover IP, which is intellectual protection. Um, there's a lot to be said for copyright in trademark. And I believe that it's worth investing in that. It's been my experience that most farmers don't share that belief. But with a couple to a few thousand dollars of investment in the services of an intellectual property um, lawyer, one could make sure their brand, their slogan, that everything was locked down so nobody could use it um, beyond just the protections that the Secretary of State will give you, making sure no one uses a name that's close to yours. Thank you. And then do you have time for one more question? Yep, yep. I have uh, six more slides, but they're all pretty quick. Great. Um, so Megan asks, in terms of taxes, you only pay on the income once when the money goes in the business account, not again when you do a disbursement as an owner. Question. That, um, so all farms should have a great accountant and the tax situation is going to depend on a few things, but mostly on the type of business structure. If you have the correct business structure for you, you should not be paying taxes twice. Yep. I'm sorry to be a little wishy-washy on that one, but it's very individualized. Okay, hey look, you should have a business accountant. Who said that? Um, it really is very important, whether you're a nonprofit or a for-profit, the worst thing you want to do is, you know, not handle your tax situation either correctly or optimally. I mean, you, you just, nobody wants, well, I'm not going to make that assumption. I don't want to pay extra taxes. I want to pay my fair share of taxes. And I'm assuming that, you know, given the choice to pay more than your fair share of taxes or your fair share of taxes, you're probably going to pick your fair share of taxes. So don't pay extra, um, don't get in trouble, get a good accountant, very important. Uh, we covered this already, the tax identification number, employee identification number, people use those um, interchangeably. Every company needs one. It's very easy to get one. When folks hire us to form their company, we do you know, the sort of the whole shebang. We choose the name, we pull the EIN, we form the LLC, we do the operating agreement sort of all together because uh, they really build on each other. Um, and it's just an online process. It's an automated number. One thing to be aware of is once you have formed a business organization, annual and depending on the organization, sometimes every five years, uh, governmental reporting is going to kick in. The government is getting hip to electronic reporting, finally. So some of this is getting automated that you can do over email, but it's very important to keep up with um, because what will happen if you lose track of this stuff is they will administratively dissolve your company and you can undo that, but it's just a pain in the butt your company becomes not in good standing, which can become problematic for insurance requirements and other stuff. 
So the key here is to just, this is an awareness point for you to be aware that annual and sometimes every five year um, permitting uh, reporting requirements will kick in. So pay attention, um, they'll send you reminders and just get those in on time. Okay, this is an important one. I've done entire, you know, one, two, three hour workshops on these topics here. So this is really um, condensing a lot. Uh, location, location, location. Uh, you need a place to operate your business, no matter, you know, whether you're a big farm, a, you know, you're making a little tiny, like you, you make a tincture type product that's real small. Um, you need a place to operate. You can buy it or rent it. There's different, you know, pros and cons of that. Um, the biggest, 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 biggest takeaway here is please don't sign a lease. Please don't buy the property until you are really sure that what you want to do is allowed to be done there. And that may sound easy, but it's, it's really quite complicated. Um, one of the most painful things I might have to say to you today is this. Um, you, under New Hampshire law, may not rely on what city and town and state officials tell you uh, over the phone is allowed to be done in places. So what I mean is this, if you, you know, let's say you're gonna move into Concord and you call Concord and say, hey, I'm moving into this property. Um, I'm gonna have pigs and sheep and diversified vegetables. I can do that, right? And they say, yes. And then you buy the property and then you do that. And then the neighbor complains. And then the code enforcement officer says, you can't do that. You, you will not have a winning case if you say, but I called, you know, I, I have a, but here's my phone record here. Look, this is the phone number. I called. They said, yes. Even if the code enforce, even if the um, person you spoke to says, yeah, he called. I, you know, I said, yes, it's just not, um, it's the, it's the common law in New Hampshire that you cannot rely on that. Um, so the ways to do that are to, number one, get it in writing, uh, get uh, an administrative decision, get a lawyer to give you a legal opinion, get go before the planning board and get a design review and have them say, oh yeah, you're good to go. This is a permitted use. There's all sorts of ways to lock it down. Um, you can have a purchase and sale agreement or a um, option that have contingencies in it that you don't have to commit until you've nailed down the use. There's lots and lots of flexibility here, but if you feel pressure to sign a lease or to purchase something and you haven't nailed down that you can do what you want to do, then what use is it to you that, hooray, you leased it or you bought it, but then after the fact, you find out that you can only do some of what you wanted to do or worse, you can't do any of what you wanted to do. It's, it's no good. I've tried to help people in this situation and sometimes we can work something out but sometimes we can't so know before you buy know before you rent uh, that's the big one and the hot topic of course here is agritourism and the extent to which you know events and weddings are allowed there's no clear answer under new hampshire law and um you know that's a, a whole different can of worms so i don't want to open it too much here we don't have enough time but I see there's a couple, there might be a couple of questions, Nikki. I think we answered all these. Okay. Earlier. Okay. All right. Unless people are chatting to you individually, nope. I can't nope. see. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention is having a business plan. And again, this is not so much legal and there's lots of resources, especially I wanted to mention New Hampshire Cooperative Extension is a terrific resource for this. Um, it's a roadmap for how to structure, run and grow your new business. So it, it's a mechanism to think about your customers, your infrastructure, your suppliers, finances, you know, 
taking your idea and really breaking it down. Where do you want to expand? How are you going to get there? Preparing now to position yourself for the future and make sh making sure that it's all going to work. And then the backup plan for when that doesn't work. And then the backup backup plan and, you know, all that good stuff. Um, having a business plan is critically important. Um, I want my clients and I want all of you to be part of the 10%. And what I mean by that is 90% of small businesses don't make it. 10% of small businesses do. I don't know the statistic of how that relates to business plans and all of the things that we've talked about today with specificity, but my very strong instinct is that the 10% have the things that we've been talking about today. They form official businesses. They have business plans. They have the correct suite of insurances. They have accountants. They do it in a thoughtful, strategic way. So that's what I'm hoping. You took away some nuggets today to get yourself set up in a uh, way that is gonna have a 10%, you're gonna be one of the ones that makes it kind of small farm and food business. So I think we might have one or two minutes before uh, Nikki takes us out um, with some concluding remarks uh, for a couple more questions. Thank you, Amy. Will asks, does BCM do IP law or do you have a recommendation, Amy, for a firm? Uh, we do not do IP law. That was one that was just, it's very specialized. And if you want to email me, I can give you some recommendations. Perfect. I'll just wait a moment and see if anyone else has any questions. Last call. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, we don't have any more questions here. I think we answered a lot of great questions during the call, um, during our webinar. So I thought that was really helpful, Amy. Thank you so much. And this concludes our workshop. And again, thank you so much, Amy, for your time today um, with this presentation and for sharing all of your knowledge with us. And as you saw, Amy put up her, her um, email there so you can contact her and BCM Environmental and Land Law if you have additional questions about uh, these topics. And I wanna thank you all for being here today as well. And we do hope that you'll join us for our next session this evening, how to create a self-sustaining edible perennial garden. And that's tonight at 7 p.m. And I know Laura is gonna put some links in the chat there. Thank you, so you can get to that session. And in the meantime, if you haven't already, please check out our virtual exhibitor fair that's featuring 17 different exhibitors, including our conference bookstore hosted by Main Street Bookends. And when you order any books through Main Street Bookends and include NOFA NH in the comments, 20% of proceeds will be donated back to NOFA. Please also mark your calendars for our upcoming programs, NOFA New Hampshire's Farm Bill Listening Session on February 17th, and that's at noon. Our Feeding the Family Organic Gardening Series, we have six sessions from February 22nd to May 3rd. Those are in the evenings on Tuesdays. And also please check out our bulk order program to save on farming and gardening supplies. The order deadline is February 28th. We still have time. And there's pickups March 19th and 20th in Andover, New Hampshire, Ware, and Rochester. And thank you so much again, and we hope to see you tonight. <laughs>